Welcome into the DNVR Rockies podcast brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, when you use code DNVR at sign up, your $5 bet on the NBA Finals can turn into $150 in free bets if you can pick the winner. That's it. That's all you've got to do when you use code DNVR on DraftKings Sportsbook all throughout the NBA Finals. I'm Patrick Lyons. And I am Susie Hunter. Patrick, what a game we saw on Tuesday night. Never know what day of the week it is, but that was a fun night for the Rockies. It was a fun night, and, and we're going to celebrate a little bit today. We've got uh, a handful of guests, too. Two is also be, can be considered a handful, one of which had a lot to do with what went down on Tuesday night. Besides, of course, the win, the history was made there by Charlie Black when we saw it over the weekend when his RBI tied him for seventh all time and an RBI or RBIs, depending no. on which side of the aisle you're you're on. Never. We are not an RBIs family. We are an RBI family. Oh, all right. Ours be Get out of here, Patrick. That is true. But he goes in and does more historical things with his 200 home run and uh, puts it into McCovey Cove. That was cool. Yeah. You, I know you love your splash hits. I love splash hits. This was a cool one. But we'll get into more of that later. We will. And, and of course, with that home run, Charlie becomes only the seventh player in Rockies history to break the 200 home run mark. Uh, and he's one shy of, of tying Dante Bichette. So if he has, uh, once he gets two more home runs, which look after what we saw out of him in not so much 2020, but definitely 2021, you thought that his power maybe had been sapped a little bit. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel pretty confident saying without looking at the numbers, he's second in the team in home runs kind of by a lot. Crone is in first by a lot, but Blackman is in second by a lot. So uh, he's going to be sixth all time in home runs very shortly here. I love that. Oh, look, we got comments. Good win and happy Charlie got number 200. Thank you. Is that Irod? Thank that, you. That it could be lowercase L Rod, but it's probably Irod. No oh. hyphen. You know what? We're going to, we're going to give you a pass on that. As we know, you got to get hype hyped for hyphen season. And, you know, I saw an interesting graphic. It was, uh, I believe it was Danny, uh, Danny Vietti from okay. CBS Sports. He's on the the Wake and Rake podcast with uh, former Red Sox third baseman Will Middlebrooks. And he had a, a very interesting stat line that he put out on Twitter. He said, 11 MLB players have had 200 or more home runs, 150 stolen bases, so got a great power, speed combination, and 300 or higher batting average. 10 of those 11 players are in the Hall of Fame. The one exception is Mike Trout. Right now, Charlie Blackman has the 200 home runs. He has 135 stolen bases, so he's a little bit shy, and is batting 298. Is Charlie on the cusp of the Hall of Fame? I don't know if he is, but shoot, you put him in a class and you put him in a group like that, it definitely makes you kind of consider things. A little bit I These are very interesting numbers. I did not see this graphic. I need to go look for it now. That is very interesting. Yeah, I I don't think I spoke to Charlie about this. Oh, oh, yeah, no, no. I didn't talk to him about this directly, but last year when uh, Larry Walker had his number 33, retired, and had a, had a quick conversation with him and, and pointed it out in right field. He hadn't noticed that it was up there yet. It was that weekend. They still had it wrapped up. It's like, Oh, I didn't even notice that was up there yet. Um, so that was kind of neat, but I, in the conversation in the midst of it talked about, you know, possibly having his number 19 be retired by the Rockies. And I mean, okay. If you want to say that you can name five Rockies players who were better than him, you might be able to do that, but five more important players who played a majority, not even just all of, but a majority of their career in Colorado. I mean, Charlie is, is gotta be up on that, that top five list. And so for a career Rockies player, it's, it's really no stretch to say number 19 should be hanging up there in the rafters at some point. You've made a good point too. I mean, yeah, of course what he's done on the field, he's also just so recognizable. Like he is easily one of the most recognizable Rockies just because of his very unique look, his his specific style. I don't know. I think that that's got to count for something, right? I think so. Yeah. You I mean, know? It, it's, it's, it's totally the Colorado look. Uh, mentioned it early on in, in Wednesday morning's podcast that uh, Rockies had two stolen bases. The 
only the second time this season they had done that. So uh, you like they were a little more aggressive on the base path. Uh, you also like that Charlie's home run did come on the 11th anniversary of his major league debut on Tuesday night. So that was, again, symbolic. You, you love those kind of things. You know what? And it's so funny, too, because he wasn't even in the lineup heading into that game, that 11th anniversary game. So the fact that he did get to come in and pinch hit and get that game winning home run and that historic splash hit, like the list goes on and on and on. How incredible is that? It's a great story. That's a great point. You're right. Was wasn't originally in the lineup. Um, not that he should. Not not that Bud Black should be on his baseball reference page looking at anniversaries and go, oh well, obviously I gotta have you in the lineup. Like, no, if those things happen, they happen. And there's always those kind of opportunities for for symmetry and anniversaries, whatever it may be. But when they happen, you go, Man, that's that's kind of beautiful. And I and I brought up the stolen base thing because just before Wednesday's game, the the Giants came together with the Phillies on a deal. They they acquired a triple A AAA catcher. They immediately called up and one of their their top prospects, and he's no longer a prospect, but he was a it was a guy that I think he still even had rookie eligibility. Susie, we had a conversation about that, right? Joey Bart, didn't we? We were talking about whether he had rookie eligibility or not, or that might have been somebody else. I don't think we had that conversation. We have not had this conversation. So I wonder who you were talking to. You tell me about the conversation you had. <laughs> It was with Kevin Henry. I confuse you two all the time. <laughs> of course, anyway. everyone does. Classic. <laughs> Kevin Henry of, of Rocks Pod. We, we were just projecting Rookie of the Year candidates, and I was like, "There's." It feels like he's been around for a while, but there was a, somewhat of a loophole, I think, that allowed him to keep his rookie eligibility. So Giuseppe Bartholomew going back down to uh, AAA, Joey Bart, and now the, the Giants have a new catcher. If the Rockies are stealing two bags off of you, I guess that means – you know, there's something really wrong with, with your catching situation. No, not really, but uh, it will be interesting to see what happens with that. Uh, the lineup still contains El Harris Montero, who was not able to gain any traction on Tuesday night, but he's back in there uh, against uh, another left-hander in Alex Wood. He'll be the DH. Ryan McMahon will be back at third base. Montero did make a really great play on Tuesday night, better than the Nolan Arenado play, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Everyone agrees on that one. <laughs> okay. No, that, come on. That, look, sometimes you got to have the purple tinted glasses a little bit. Sometimes you can have fun and pretend you're wearing the purple tinted glasses. But, oh, boy, that Nolan play was crazy. But Montero did a great job on, on the barehanded play. So now McMahon has saw what, uh, seen what Nolan did, and he saw what Montero did. He's in the stadium where the famous tarp play went down at in San Francisco. So Ryan McMahon. On Wednesday night, that will be one of those stories. By the time you might listen to this, you'll have already seen that big Ryan McMahon play that he made defensively, at least. Yeah, here. we'll see what happens. Uh, wow. Uh, so many iconic plays from Nolan. One of them just very recently. Jose Iglesias still batting fifth on Wednesday night. Elias Diaz does get another start there. At catcher, not sure if you saw on social media, Colton Walker's doing better after his sh shoulder surgery. So mm -hmm. uh, you put out put that out there on Instagram. So it's good to see him doing well uh, in in general speaking. I got my nice In and Out Burger shirt on today again. Oh. I, I, this is one of the reasons why you have to make sure you're watching on the YouTube channel uh, for DNVR Sports. is It's for all of our swag and and see Susie's new setup because now you're 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 pro. You were an amateur oh my gosh. before. No, you were. I I've but been in just in, I've just been in love with my home studio as it's coming together more. I just got a new webcam. I set up an extra monitor, so I've got a laptop here. I've got a monitor here. Um, I'm I need to work on. I was telling Kale, our super producer, before the show that I need to work on this wall. So stay tuned. Next time you see this setup, it's gonna be even better. But I'm super stoked about my home studio setup right now. It looks good. You're so you're opposed to going with the green screen style. Is that correct? I don't really know where I would put it in here. So like my office is also the guest room and like there isn't like a lot of space to put a green screen behind me. Maybe I will. I don't know. I got to look on Amazon and see what's available. And that's cheap. So maybe I dabbled in it. I dabbled in the green screen a little bit. And then on St. Patrick's Day, I wore green suspenders and then it just looked like I, I don't I don't know what. 
I had lines in my body. It was very strange that the image was that's, appearing on my person. That's what green screens. Did you not know the green screens do that? Also, did this really happen or is this like an improv that you're doing? It did happen. I Kelp might not remember it, but uh, yeah, it was St. Patrick's Day uh, 2021. Yeah. Google it. You got to go I back. Mean, you gotta go I've back worked catalog. in TV, so I know you can't wear green clothes on a green screen. You can't even wear, you can't wear yellow sometimes or like some shades of blue. Like it's tricky. You can't wear anything even close to green. No, it was it was subtle, uh, but again, if, if you if you know, you know. So, uh, but but if yeah, you know, you know, and you didn't know. That's it. No, looking forward to seeing the the upgrades on that man. Ezekiel Tovar, I tell you, uh, wrote about it on the DNVR.com. Now only fifty cents for your first month, but went through and Bud Black obviously talked about him over the weekend. We it was one of those days there, and you've been there for it, Susie. Obviously, when Maybe maybe television isn't there, or it's uh, it's late in the morning or early in the morning, whatever it, where it is. There's nobody around, and it's really just almost like uh, we're BSing. We're we're just talking with a dude, and he's given us some insight. And so when it, it's not all about the the comings and goings on uh, the big league roster or the lineup construction and who's slumping, it's all right. Let's look at some of the bigger picture things and let's talk about prospects. And yeah, he uh, he was glowing. Uh, when it comes to Ezekiel Tovar, do we see him this season? I'm going to have to say maybe. In the past, I think the answer was no, but I might have to say maybe now. I know, yeah. And I've I've been saying, like, no, he's not ready. He's not ready yet. Uh, but he's just been so electric in Hartford. You have to You have to wonder when he's, first of all, going to graduate out of Hartford. But, this, I mean, when are we going to see him? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he, he he's more. He's always been glove first. The defense has has never been a question, and now the bat's really a a bonus. So you know, if you do call him up late in the season, he he actually could help solidify the defense. And yeah, maybe you lose something. You know, uh, going away from a Jose Iglesias, but you'd probably upgrade defensively. And again, you're you're getting him some of that big league experience. So. Uh, it will really be really interesting to see, you know, what happens because once a player reaches double A, that's really when it starts to count most because the jump from high A to double A is the hardest one in the game. And Daniel Montano uh, had had a couple folks reach out to me on Twitter about him. He started off really well in Hartford, but small sample size. We'll kind of wait and see what happens uh, with him. But Tovar has been doing it here now for two months, so um, it's it's another player where the the hype does seem like it is real for real i mean listen everyone's been hype on tovar for quite some time we gotta get jeff dooley on the show um to tell us about what he's seen but i think i might have mentioned that he was like oh yeah let's hope he get calls up soon but not too soon we love having him yeah we we could have the hype bros right we've got uh the hype uh the hyphen hype for brandon rogers b-rod and then we've just got the straight up Ezekiel Tovar hype, the hype bros. It's uh, it's it's very exciting. Just like it's an exciting time, of course, on the corner of Colfax, New York, at the DNVR bar, where you know we're going to have all of the Stanley Cup finals, all four games. Calling it right now. Well, all right, I can't I can't go that far, but we will have at least four games going on when the Stanley Cup finals begins. Don't have a schedule yet. Tampa Bay's making it interesting. It's two two, so we could have a week until we get the first game of the Stanley Cup, but we are going to have watch parties. And yes, I've heard some people say that even if they could get a ticket into Ball Arena, they may prefer to be at uh, the DNVR bar. Uh, Everyone think... says that. Everyone says that. Every... Okay. I, I don't, I've heard it from like a, a good group of people, but I, I don't know if that's true for everybody. I mean, that's... I mean we heard Kyle Freeland talking true. about it. Everyone knows he's the biggest Avs fan. That is true. That is true. Uh, but yeah, we'll have those. And if you're a member, you get a member sized beer. Uh, you get extra raffle tickets at all of those watch parties to win some free gear, uh, discounts on any of the tailgates, party buses, you name it, all that and more members only discord where we'll go and, and hit you up. Susie was doing it today in the discord, letting folks know, Hey, we got a couple special guests. If you got questions for them also make sure you're watching today for those guests. So we're going to tip you off to a couple things that we might not tip others off, but we will do it for you because you're a member. 
to the dnvr.com. Now only 50 cents for your first month. And look, if you can't make it out to the DNVR bar, we understand, but you can still watch the Avs with Ivaca TV. Same is also true for the Nuggets. We're talking Altitude Sports, AT&T Sportsnet, and yes, the DNVR Sports Channel on YouTube. You're going to get it all with this great package from Ivaca TV. It's Ivaca.tv slash DNVR, zero hidden fees. It's $25 per month, plus the cost of the receiver. In fact, if you use code DNVR on top of going to avaca.tv slash DNVR, you're also going to get even more of a discount, $10 off those first three months. So you're going to get Rockies. You're going to get DU Pioneers. If you're into the college game, CSU Rams, Rapids, Mammoth, Rapids. Soccer season is legit. Get ready. World Cup's coming this winter. Yes, a winter World Cup first and probably last time. That happens, but Avaca TV is going to get you all set up for that. Go to avaca.tv slash DNVR. And going back to the Av stuff, we, we've talked about it numerous times. You got to go to breckbrew.com so you can nominate someone that you know and love, someone who's a community star, so that Breckenridge Brewery can send them to a Stanley Cup Finals game. Seriously, they're giving away Stanley Cup Finals tickets. They've been doing it all playoffs long, and they want to celebrate with you. They give you some tickets, a pair of uh, playoff tickets, as I said, uh, gear, and the drink of the season, Avalanche Ale. But it's not for yes. you. Again, it's for someone you know and love that deserves it. Be a little bit selfless in that way. And then, yeah, if they win, you can hold it over their head for the rest of their life. So in the end, you might end up getting back more because of that. That's how I like you, to look at things. You know what? You nominate a good person and maybe they'll bring you along to the game with you, with them. Ooh, you know? great point. I mean, they're a good person to begin with, right? If they're a community star, they are probably going to be like, all right, you know, for the rest of our lives, I will pick up the first drink, the first beer on the house here at the DNVR bar, whatever it may be. They're, they're going to hook it up. I love it. Our buddy Josh Sushan hooked it up. Susie, you caught up with him earlier on Wednesday. Got the lowdown on those younger players that are on the cusp of the major. They're they're a flight away, but you can say that about all affiliates. They're a drive away. <laughs> you could you can make that six hour drive from from Albuquerque to Denver. And there are some prospects we got to keep our eye on. As I mentioned in my article on the DNVR.com with Welker and Rollison, done for the year. They can be moved over to the 60-day IL, and that could create two new spots on the 40-man. And Josh Sushan is going to tell us all about maybe who some of those surprise players could be. All right, joining us now on the DNVR Rockies podcast is the voice of the Albuquerque Isotopes, Josh Sushan. Josh, how are you doing today? I'm outstanding. Thank you for having me back on. Yes, um, so last time we had you on, um, you know, we talked about a lot of the changes happening down at Triple A, but I want to talk about a new one that we haven't seen since the last time you were on the ABS, the Robo Umps. I know you've talked about it a lot, including on MLB Network. But what is that looking like down there, and how is that changing or not changing how the game is played? Out? First of all, they're not a robot. There's a lot of people who actually thought that there was going to be a robot. And so I had to break the news gently to people that R2-D2 is not behind plate. And then I was scolded by people who let me know that R2-D2 is a droid, not a robot. So the way that it works is the umpire has an earpiece in. It is not connected like I'm wearing right now. It's actually specially molded so that it fits more comfortably into their ear than a standard earbud might. All the umpires had them done in the off season. It's, it's not a human that tells the umpire. It just goes straight from the laptop into the umpire's ear. Catchers have told me they do not hear it. The umpires have told me that the strike call is a little bit louder than the ball call. And it comes across basically instantly. By the time the ball is in the catcher's glove, the umpire hears whether it's a ball or a strike. So this began on May 17th. So we are now about three and a half weeks into this. I can tell you that, number one, it's been seamless in terms of the umpire getting the call. The umpire gets it right away. I was really unsure about how quickly that would happen. Certainly, there's still arguments. There's a bunch of arguments. I don't know who to be mad at, right? Um, so in terms of, like, who it's favoring, I don't know. I think that it's still – I think we're all still getting used to it a little bit. 
I, I can tell you the number one thing is that the plate is 17 inches. An extra inch was added to each side of the plate for the strike zone to make it 19 inches. There's a lot of people who wondered why this is the case. What I was told by Joe Martinez from Major League Baseball's office is that they've taken a look at what the usual strike zone is for all of the Major League umpires. And on average, the Major League umpires give about an extra inch on each side of the plate. And they wanted the ABS system that's being used in the Pacific Coast League to mirror what the Major League umpires usually call on a regular basis. So that's why it's 19 inches. The other thing to keep in mind, though, Susie, is that a baseball is approximately three inches in diameter. And if any part of the baseball hits the strike zone, it does not have to be 51%. does not have to be 10%. If even just one millimeter of that baseball hits the strike zone, then it's considered a strike. So you can make the argument that the strike zone is actually like 25 inches now if you give three inches on each side. Now, Joe Martinez disagreed with my assessment that the strike zone is now 25 inches, but I can tell you that it does feel like it's a little bit wider uh, width-wise, and top and bottom are a little bit more um, – well, they're obviously more consistent, but you're not getting as many high calls. You're not getting as many low calls. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, uh, thank you for the intel. Uh, another – Another addition, the pitch clock. I know we talked about that last time we had you on, but uh, you mentioned when we were setting this up that it's having less and less of an impact. Um, so what exactly does that look like? All right. So I updated my very extensive spreadsheet that, that I put together for this. You've got a spreadsheet? Of course I have a spreadsheet. Amazing. <laughs> Do you really think that I would not take the opportunity to make a spreadsheet when it comes to looking at the pace of play? I am just surrounded by spreadsheet guys. This is hilarious. What is on your spreadsheet? Okay, so before the start of the strict enforcement, we played nine games and the average length of game in those nine games was three hours and 11 minutes. Now that's a pretty small sample size, nine games, right? We were at Oklahoma City, we were home for three, but nine games, we averaged three hours and 11 minutes. Then the strict enforcement of the pitch clock began on April 15th and we played 25 games that were nine innings before the start of the automated ball strike system. And the average time of game was two hours and 39 minutes. And so that is, if I do some quick math here, 21 and one, that's 32 minutes faster. 32 minutes faster once the, the pace of play, the pitch clock was put into effect. Then the start of the ABS began on May 17th. And the first six games that we played at Salt Lake were all pretty quick. We had one really long game, but all the others were, were mostly under two and a half. And I don't know if this is a coincidence. I don't know if this is because there's just different umpiring crews who enforce this differently. I don't know if it's because pitchers and batters have, have figured out where they are allowed to take a little bit of a breather. But we've been on a stretch over the last now two and a half series where we are averaging almost three hours once again. Hmm. We played a bunch of games in Sugarland that were mostly low scoring. A few of them were higher scoring. We played some extra inning games that I did not include, but those games were would have been way more than three hours if they had been nine inning games. So it's starting to tick back up, and I have a couple of theories on why this might be happening. Number one is just you get into the summer, the ball carries more, there's going to be more offense, that type of thing. Again, there could be umpires that are just not enforcing this strictly enough. But what I think the other thing that's happening is that pitchers realize if I have 14 seconds – I can use all 14 seconds. I think initially there was such a concern that I'm going to get a violation against me. I'm going to get a ball that I'm going to throw the ball with five seconds, with six seconds, with three seconds. And now pitchers realize I have 14 seconds. And then when there's someone on base, I have 19 seconds. And so I think they're more likely to use all of the time that they have. And then for hitters, it was very rare for any hitter to step out of the batter's box. They're allowed to step out. They just have to be back in within nine seconds. And I think a lot more hitters are getting used to just the rhythm of they take their swing, they miss or whatever, they step out, they do a quicker routine between pitches, they get back in before there's nine seconds left. So they're not in violation. And so we're seeing fewer and fewer pace of play violations, but we're starting to see the games tick up in length. And I don't know what it's like throughout the rest of minor league baseball. Um, this could just be a blip on the radar. I'm, I'm really curious to see how this happens over the next two weeks. But again, we're, we're back up to close to three hours once again. Oh, that's so surprising. Yeah, you guys were flying through those games at the start of the season, but it sounds like guys have just gotten used to the timing a little more and are now just like taking better advantage of the time they have. Yeah, and, and I the other thing that I think is interesting, Susie, and I was talking to, I'm, I'm pointing here, uh, Tim Haggerty is the El Paso play-by-play -play announcer. And he's Hi, Tim. There. And um, we were talking about this today, and we both noticed that 
momentum seems to be more intense with the pitch clock. Meaning if the pitcher is rolling, if the pitcher is throwing a lot of strikes and getting a lot of quick outs, innings are even faster and faster, and the pitcher can really get on a roll. On the other hand, if the pitcher is struggling to throw strikes, if the pitcher thinks he's getting squeezed by the computer, if the pitcher just doesn't get the benefit of the doubt on a certain call, used to be that they could step off, they could go to the rosin bag, they could rub up a baseball, they could throw over, they could really slow them th themselves down. They can't do that anymore. And so I think that leads to – you see more back-to-back -back walks. You see more pitchers struggling, and then the momentum really, really starts to speed up on them. I also think that really lengthy at-bats that go eight, nine, ten pitches, that wears down a pitcher more. And even if the pitcher gets an out, in the past, maybe the catcher goes out for a visit. Maybe the umpire gives them a new baseball. They're able to kind of catch their breath after this lengthy battle. Not anymore. The, the clock is running. And so I think that you see – the war of attrition against a pitcher, if you have some really lengthy at-bats, can really make an impact. Oh, that's interesting. All right. We need to do some updates on some of your some of the prospects that are down there in Albuquerque. Uh, let's we'll start with Coco Montez. He's had four homers in three games recently, and also just, in general, one of my favorite names in the Rockies system. So how is he looking overall? Well, let's start with the name, Coco. Okay, so he has the same name as his father, Robert. When he came home from the hospital, he told me that his mom shaved his head and his grandfather said that he looked like a, a bald coconut. And there's a longer word in Spanish that I can't remember right now, but the shortened version of that word is Coco. And so that's how he got the name Coco, because he looked like a bald coconut when he came home. And so the family always called him that. In school, he would write his name on, on papers that said Robert, but with all of his baseball, high school, college was always Coco. Uh, second, he does not wear batting gloves. He has not worn batting gloves since he was about 12 years old. So that's a uniqueness about him. And then third, I mean, he's just hes just a guy you can put everywhere. Second, short, third. He's not known for his power, but he's hitting for power right now. he He's known for doubles, really. And sometimes the older you get, those doubles start to turn into home runs, especially when you start playing to 5,200 feet altitude. That tends to happen. Although I must say, we were at sea level last weekend, and he hit two home runs at Sugarland. He pulled one, and he hit the other to right center, which is really hard to do at sea level in Sugarland. And he's just a just a just a scrappy ball player who's always going to be really good at bat. He's a good dude. Teammates like him. Uh, it's, he's basically he took the place of Colton Welker, and he's not going to hit for the power overall that Welker will hit for. But there's a lot of things he does that can help you win a game. Oh, very cool. All right, now what's the latest on Dom Nunez? How is he doing now that he's getting more regular at bats in Albuquerque? Yeah, I think the key there is regular at bats. It was. I think I added it up where in his first 10 days back at AAA, he got as many at-bats as he got in the first six weeks of the season in the major leagues. And to be candid, he struggled when he first came back here. And that happens a lot. I've seen a lot of guys, they come back and they want to try so hard to prove that, they're, that they can get back to the major leagues and put up numbers that they end up being really aggressive and swinging out a lot of pitches out of the strike zone. And it just takes a while to just get your timing back and feel for the strike zone. And Dom's really turned it up. He homered yesterday. He was on base four times yesterday. He had a couple of extra base hits when we were at Sugar Land. He's always been really good defensively. And I think we're starting to get back to the Dom Nunez that I saw with the Isotopes in 2019 and what Rockies fans saw in 20. Uh, 2020 and 2021, you know, I think that Dom, there's a lot of things that Dom can do to help a team. And, and I, and I think that you could just kind of see it with every game that he's starting to get his timing back more and more. Cause it's just hard when you don't play much. And now he's playing almost every day. He's basically starting four out of every six and usually hitting second. And when, when he goes really well, he can help a team win a lot of, a lot of games too. All right. Great to hear. All right. Let's hear about Riley Smith and Jose Arania, a couple of newer faces with the Rockies organization. How are they looking in the rotation? Short answer is really, really good. So two guys that were not at spring training with the Rockies, Riley Smith was competing for a job at the Diamondbacks and pretty surprisingly got released at the end of spring training. Jose Arania was with uh, the Brewers, he was in the bullpen, and then when rosters shrank from 28 to 26 in early May, he was designated for assignment and ended up getting released. Rockies have picked them both up, and I love it. <laughs> These guys are both really good. Riley Smith throws a lot of sinkers, and he gets it up to about 93, 94 with his sinker. He's got some secondary pitches that are really good. He works really fast. He works really efficiently. You definitely do not need the clock when he's on the mound because he's just going to get it and pitch and go. Um, another guy liked by his teammates. He's just, he, he's just going to attack you. He's just going to come at you with this stuff and he's going to give up some home runs, but he's going to throw a bunch of strikes. 
and you know, look, home runs are part of our modern baseball. Um, his last two starts have been really good. Six innings, both times, three runs, two runs. And then for Urania, he made his debut Sunday and he threw mostly sliders, but when he threw a fastball, it was 97 miles per hour on average. And he dominated four scoreless innings. There was only one fly ball. Everything else was a ground ball out or a ground ball hit or a strikeout. He didn't walk anybody. So for a guy who had not pitched in a competitive game in two months, I thought it was really impressive what his command was like. So both those guys, I think both those guys can help the Rockies at some point, whether it's as a starter or as a reliever. They both have major league experience. I love that they're in our rotation right now. They make our team so much better with what they've done and just their presence because both of them have major league experience. I think that carries a lot of weight in a triple a clubhouse, especially Urania has got like eight years of major league service time. So I'm glad to have them uh, for as long as we have them. That's awesome. That sounds fun. Let's stick with pitching. What is the latest on Peter Lambert? I don't know all the details. I just know that he was supposed to start yesterday and he did not. And that's because his elbow was once again, giving him problems. I don't know the severity of that. And it's probably not for me to say anyways, but he was placed on our injured list. And, you know, it's no secret. He had Tommy John surgery in 2020, spent basically all of last year rehabbing all throughout the Rockies organization. From what I read, he had a little bit of a setback in spring training. So that slowed him. He had been building up from one inning to two innings to three innings to four innings. And whatever, within the last start, which was at Sugarland, and then the days after that, he was feeling some something in his elbow. Again, I don't know the severity. But I'm really disappointed because Pete's such a good pitcher when he's on, and I know how hard he's worked to try to come back. And I think it just goes to show that Tommy John surgery has a really high success rate, but it's not – it doesn't – it's not It's not 100%. You know, it happens. And some guys come back in 10 to 12 months, and some guys come back in 16 months, and some guys take two years to come back. And I hope that this is minor, but anytime that you have to stop and start as many times as Pete has done, especially this year, then it then it becomes you know more and more concerning. Yeah, definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, one more thing, one more guy that we want to keep an eye on, Sean Bouchard. What is going on with him? How's he doing down there? Yeah, Sean Bouchard's a guy who has not received a whole lot of publicity from a prospect standpoint. But this is an interesting guy. This guy, okay, he can play left field, he can play right field, he can play first base. Last year was at double A, made his triple A debut this year. He missed some time because he hurt his shoulder making a diving catch. So he missed about three weeks, but he's been back and he's hitting in the middle of our lineup on a regular basis. Um, I'm going to cheat and look at my roster that is to the left of me so that I can list that he is listed at 6'3", 215. He can run. He stole another base yesterday. He's got six stolen bases now. He can hit for power. He can hit for average. He, you know, it's a, it's a polished guy. Went to UCLA, played a high level of college baseball. And Bouchard's one of those guys who just sneaks up on you. Maybe like you come to one game and he doesn't stand out. And then the more you watch him over time, over weeks, over months, you realize this guy can help the team in a lot of ways. And he's basically, I can say this, because of all the injuries that we've had between Welker and Trejo is out now and Tim Lopes is out and, Geez, I'm losing track of all the other players that we've had out due to injuries. Taylor Snyder, Carlos Perez has recently come back. Brett Boswell has recently come back. He's gotten an opportunity to not just play some, but play a lot in bat second and bat third, and he's thriving right now. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what he can do when he continues to get this many at-bats. Thriving is a word I love to hear. All right, thank you, Josh. Tell our listeners slash viewers where we can follow all of your stuff. Well, you can always go to MILB.com, and then there's a bunch of links from there. You can go to abqisotopes.com, and that's where you can listen to the broadcasts. If you want to pay the service to watch all of the games, you can go to MILB.tv. You can follow me on Twitter, Josh underscore Sushan, common spelling on Sushan. And so there's a lot of different ways to keep in touch with everything. All right. Well, have a good game tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Amazing insight there from yeah. – Josh, particularly considering all the injuries that the Isotopes have had, and yet there are players stepping up, stepping in, and and doing a good job, being being a veteran presence. Like you know, Bouchard's not that young. Uh, I can remember back in 2018 being in Low A Asheville and being kind of you know enticed by his power. Chad Spangenberger and uh, Casey Golden, three names of guys who haven't made it to the majors yet, but hey, I had my eye on them way back when. 
Bouchard was probably third on that list, and yet he stuck around. He stayed healthy. He's got all those tools. So it's good to see uh, veteran guys like that, as well as Riley Smith and Jose Urania, doing a good job and and keeping everyone's head on the level down there in the Isotopes locker room. Yeah, for sure. I was really, uh, yeah, I was very interested to hear all about what's going on down there. I'm surprised to hear that the pitch clock that was speeding up games so much is no longer having that effect. And it's probably a lot of variables, but I am a little sad to see that those games that they were flying through down in Albuquerque, not really happening anymore. Well, I feel like it's similar to... to the games that the Rockies have played where I feel like the first month of the season, they were flying by so quickly. It was wonderful. Uh, but now all of a sudden they're going a lot longer, whether they're scoring a lot of runs or not. Um, they're, they've gone back up to like three and a half hours. So uh, that was really interesting. And, and to know that the, the strike zone size is actually a little bit larger than the 17 inch plate uh, in order to mirror what MLB umpires typically do. Uh, and, and the fact that pitchers don't really have that opportunity to catch their breath like they would previously. So they might be getting taxed a little bit early. They might be, uh, having to ru- not rush pitches, but you lose your command a little bit, uh, if you're fatigued in that way. And so, uh, all of that could be tied into those longer games. So that was very interesting to learn about the robo slash droid umpires, uh, that are being used right now in AAA. They are not droids, as we've also learned. There are no robots walking around our minor league ballparks. Unfortunately, no. But fortunately, (laughs) uh, Coco Montez's power is developing. Love to see that. 37 doubles last year in Hartford. Had the most in the Eastern League. And now some of those doubles are becoming home runs. He can play second, third, and shortstop. So that's uh, exciting to hear that about Robert Patrick Montez. Oh, yes. I also loved hearing the um, origin of his nickname. I didn't know that story before, actually. We I, didn't I really didn't intersect in Hartford, so. Yeah, no, no, did, didn't didn't know that one. Different story than Coco Crisp, I think. Mm-hmm. I think it's different type of story. And I know they have different grandmothers. I mean, just look at the last names. But the first names are are very similar obviously indeed so that was uh wonderful kind of getting the lowdown on that and and the lowdown that you need is that light shade dispensary colorado's premier dispensary and, and i say it like that lowdown because i don't know a lot about that world I, I don't know a lot about marijuana the thc the cbd but whenever i've gone with friends and family light shade has done an amazing job breaking it down making it simple so you feel comfortable with it. That's that's one of the major benefits for actually going to one of these locations. There's 11 in the Denver metro area. There's one not too far from the bar, eight-minute drive. That's it. So uh, I think it's like two miles. So, I mean, shoot, you could even walk it if you were really hard-pressed or if it's a nice day. Jump on a scooter, whatever it is, 6th Avenue. That's it, eight minutes away by car. But they're going to have the tinctures, accessories, more, you name it. It's Colorado's premier dispensary for a reason. They've got 11 now, and they're only continuing to grow. So check them out, lightshade.com, so you can feel comfortable. Walk into one of those locations. And also, mention mention DNVR so they can give you 25% off your order. Can't beat that. You also Can't can't beat it. No, you can't. And another, and speaking of greens, and speaking of feeling better, I got to talk about a product I love. It's how I start my day. Yeah, it's it's how I start my day. It's one scoop of Athletic Greens. Put it in a little bottle and about 12 ounces of water usually. Nice and keep it cold. It tastes a little bit better that way. Uh, Tastes tastes great even when it's not. But with one scoop, I get 75 high-quality vitamins, whole food, sourced superfoods, probiotics, minerals, adaptogens. It gets me starting my day right. Before I have that first cup of coffee, it starts to give me that clarity already. It's it's a great little micro habit that has huge benefits for me. And when I'm on the go, I take their travel packets with me and I can still continue to do the good things I need to do to keep my body on point. And Athletic Greens is helping you keep your act together and on point by giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash ROC. That's the first three letters of Rockies. And if you don't use that slash ROC, 
they're not going to hook you up with all those freebies. So athleticgreens.com slash ROC, the first three letters of Rockies. It's going to allow you to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I love it. I'm a big fan of athletic greens. Oh, I love it. I mean, all the players down in spring training had that. I don't, I don't think they have any kind of deal. It could be coincidental. I, I don't know, but it, there, there, there is no coincidence that the top athletes are, are taking this to start their day. Um, I'm not a top athlete, but I do start my day with it. Now, it's a great insurance for my health. We should have asked our next, next guest if he has insurance on his vehicle, on his watercraft, because he's, uh, he's an interesting cat and uh, has some, some really interesting stories. Susie, did you enjoy talking with our friend? He's now our friend, McCovey yeah. Cove. Dave, did you enjoy it as much as I did? I loved talking to him. He's such an interesting guy. Um, I'm so stoked. I feel like this was such a good show today, too. Uh, I loved our conversation. He was just even more entertaining than I could have imagined. Yeah, he's absolutely great. Look, you're saying, wait, we got like a Giants guy on, and he's not a player. He's a fan. Look, if you don't know McCovey Dave, Trust that. And if you do know McCovey Dave, you're already like, I don't, I don't care. You don't have to talk anything about Rockies. But we actually talk plenty about the Colorado Rockies, plenty about the Cove itself and what life is like out there on a body of water that can get a little bit wild at times. So here is the interview with Susie and myself and McCovey Cove Dave. We've got a super special guest on tap here. His name is Dave Edlin, but you probably know him a lot better as McCovey Cove, Dave, and look, we were, would have loved to have had Charlie Blackman on today to talk about his big home run on Tuesday night, but I think he's got a game to get ready for. I think you do too. So we got the next best thing and Charlie Blackman. We got the guy who got his ball. McCovey Cove, Dave, how you doing? I'm doing really awesome. It was a great night last night, particularly for Rocky fans, but it was exciting for me to chase down Charlie's milestone ball. Now, I know you mentioned to me before this interview, this was no accident. This was no coincidence. You knew this milestone was coming and you planned yes. accordingly. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes I plan out a year in advance. I caught the 1,000 Giants home run at the park and this was years back. And when they got to 950 to end one year, I said, I really want to get a number of thousand. And uh, at AT&T Park or Oracle Park now as it's called, I have about a one in 20 chance of getting that home run if I'm there that night because about 9% of the home runs that hit reach the water, either bouncing or flying. And I have a 70% chance of getting the ball between my competitors. So I have about a 6% chance or one in 20. So I had a one in 20 chance of getting Charlie's ball if he hit it last night. I love, I love, I love that your use of numbers. Yeah. He ran the numbers. He knows exactly the odds. So I'm glad that you made the best of those odds and got that ball. Uh, it was very exciting. Well, and Charlie has not hit a home run into the Cove in his 11-year career. He's way overdue. And uh, when I saw him get that uh, home run number 199 the other night in the ninth inning, I knew he was right there. The other uh, milestone he's at is he's just under 1,500 career hits. He has 1,498 hits. That was the one last night. So there's a chance that 1,500 comes out to the Cove in the next two days. Yeah, I believe we've got four Rocky splash hits. Corey Dickerson had been the previous uh, one before Charlie, and then two by Carlos Gonzalez. Do you have a – you probably should give our listeners an idea of, of how many splash hits uh, you, you have in yes. your collection and if you have one from every National League team by this point. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Rockies was one of the ones I was missing, surprisingly. Um, I have, I think I actually have 12 of the 15. So I have three to go, but it'll be a nice goal to chase. Um, the, um, you know, I'm interested in, in milestone uh, home runs. Say on the Giants, for instance, I probably do paddle harder for a Giants home run, um, the home team. And so far since I started doing this in 2005, I have 40% of all the Giants splash hits, um, whether I'm at home or not. So half the time I'm at home because the probability of a home run that night are low, so I stay home. But so far I've gotten 40% of the home runs and uh, I go to about half of the games. 
That's impressive. One of the I, things that I wanted to do the most when I came to San Francisco, but it didn't pan out, I wanted to get a kayak and come out to the cove. How often do new people kind of enter into the mix? And yes. how does that how does it work? Do you guys chat? Yeah. Do you exchange tips? <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. So basically on Saturday and Sunday this weekend, because more people can get off, we'll probably have 50 kayaks each day, 50 kayaks or small boats. And I, we welcome into the cove. A lot of them are not serious about um, chasing home runs. They're really there to enjoy. Like we're gonna have fantastic weather this weekend. They might have a bigger boat with some food. And um, so we'll, we'll have 50 plus people in the cove and uh, it'll be very exciting. And the best time to probably go and, and do that is actually during batting practice because you know as you point out you know there hasn't been you know a ton of those splash hits i think we might be up to 90 yes. well not maybe 94, 94 for the giants yeah and yes. then there's only like 50 or so from uh visiting teams so it's not that many but during batting practice you can probably get a lot more right yes although you know what's happened is last year the ball was livelier uh, we had a record number of home runs reach McCovey Cove last year because MLB was using a livelier ball. And so we might have had five balls coming out in batting practice to the Cove last year. Now it's down to one. It's just because the ball's not traveling as, as well. And honestly, I don't think it's going to change. The home run numbers are definitely down this year. And uh, I don't think they're going to change the ball. It's a ball that just doesn't fly as, as far. Is but it a ball? Yep. No, go ahead. But the Cove is a fun place to be. Um, just seeing a ball come over there is very exciting. Very, very exciting. And uh, there's a lot of partying that goes on there. And uh, it's just a great place. You need to bring a radio. Um, if you don't have a kayak, you can rent one at Pier 40, which is right next to the park. Go to citykayak.com and you can rent your kayak in advance. So if you come out for a Saturday game, you can have it rented a month before and uh if you come up to me in the cove i will give you some tips i will tell you everything but i will make your experience more enjoyable and i'll tell you how to get on tv a lot of people want to get on tv i'm here to help all right yeah actually speaking of tv we saw a lot of you on tv on the giants broadcast last night but we saw you like for a while talking to two guys out on yes. Yeah. yeah. What were, who were they? What were you guys talking about? Yes. What was that exchange? Because we saw so much. Yes. Of it. So it was the negotiation over the ball. And those were two Giants managers. Now, I actually, I wanted Charlie to have the ball. I knew he wanted it. So honestly, I was going to give it for almost nothing. But uh, they were not very generous. So for instance, on a milestone ball, you should be able to meet with the player for like five minutes and give him the ball. I've done that on home runs. I got the 300th home run from Carlos Beltran. I got to meet with them. And um, the Giants would not let me meet with Charlie Blackman. And the other option is once they said, well, because of COVID issues, we couldn't do that. I tried to get a Charlie Blackman jersey and they would not deliver. And so I'm a little disappointed on the Giants. I love the Giants management, but I ended up basically uh, giving the ball up um, for what is a very beautiful Charlie uh, Blackman signed bat. And uh, so it's very beautiful. It says, you know, it's, it's, just, it's the bat he would use playing. He has a certain bat and it's got his name in it. It's very cool. He signed it. So I do have a good memory. Thing, but honestly, meeting the player and handing him the ball, that is a greater reward than a bat to me. I imagine it's easier to make that kind of exchange when it's a Giants player, when yeah. it's a true splash hit, than it's the, the visiting team. Yes. But you know what? For what it's worth, you would have been been stuck out on McCovey Cove for about another hour after the game if you were going to yes. meet Charlie Blackman because he's got a very uh, long and arduous workout yes. routine. But but that would have been nice uh, for them to kind of you know work that yes. out somehow. Well, it's been good. Over time, I've had the benefit of meeting a lot of great baseball players. You know, I caught a, spl a splash hit from David Ortiz, Big Poppy of Boston, and I got to meet him several times. I got to do selfies with him. And that makes it really fun as a fan to kind of get to know the player. In a instantly, I knew Big Poppy was very cool and very friendly. And uh, um, on some home runs, I haven't met the players because of COVID. Um, 
like I caught three Mike Yastrzemski home runs from the Giants. And because of COVID, I've actually not met Mike yet. Um, but I actually went to the last game his grandfather played, 1983. I was at Fenway, and uh, that was his grandfather's last game. So, Oh, my gosh. What a connection. That's amazing. Yes. So, And I also, you know, I'm known to catch home runs in the water, but I actually – travel uh, around the parks, including Coors Field, and I catch home runs with my mitt. I made the 2017 fan catch of the year. They videotape them and compare them on Twitter. Um, and uh, it's really fun. And and it used to be that we depended on the TV camera on the side of McCovey Cove to kind of connect us with the baseball world. But now with the advent of smartphones, I broadcast my own stories. Um, and so I put a little clip that you may have seen for about 60 seconds to my fans after the Charlie Blackman home run came in. And now you can do it from your smartphone. I feel like I got my little own little uh, radio or TV station. You also do have a great, you have a great voice for it too. But yeah, I, I saw the video that you posted. We also saw a shot of you filming it while you were in the water. So I was like, oh, this is full circle right here. I'm seeing all angles of the production. It's really fun. And so like this home run right here, this was a Mother's Day home run I got um, on May 8th this year. And I did a personal thing. I made a dedication to my mom who passed away last year. And it was a very short, like 30 seconds. And um, before that would have been stranded on her phones and stuff. But I posted it to my followers and then ESPN got it. And next thing you know, Eight million plus people had looked at that video on TikTok, and so it was really special. And um, I basically read hundreds of personal stories about their mothers, and uh, it was a great thing for me. I enjoyed every one. I imagine that's been one of the things, obviously, that's changed over the years. Now, you know, Oracle Park's been around for basically twenty years now. Is you know being able to to reach out to people, share your story. Uh, and that, that social media component, a camera, a phone. What are some of the other things that you have on your kayak that you know makes it a little bit unique that a yes. typical kayaker might not have, but you, McCovey yes. Cove Dave, need to have on your kayak? So I have the key things. For, uh, in addition to equipment, you have to be willing to swim at times. And it was a little like comedy cops last night. I was not in the best position, but I always go hard for the ball. And uh, my friend with less experience, he had a little net that got caught. And so you have to make sure you're prepared. And the motto of my family is never unprepared. I mean, that's what all I think about. So I study all the players, all the left-handed hitters before the game, usually five years worth of home runs. I study their landing location. So each time I move to the most likely landing location for that player. Then... Um, I have the fastest kayak. It, it, it's very narrow. It can be kind of like a log rolling type of thing, but for speed, if I'm in a race, that kayak is, a, is an advantage. Um, I also have little things, you know, sponges and whatnot. I also have the ability that once I jump out that I actually can jump back in my very narrow kayak. Um, I carry food in there. I even carry double radios. So I have two transistor radios that are real time. But like yesterday when I lost a radio on the Blackman Homer, I really had a second one in reserve. I could have gone back to work, but that negotiation took a lot of time. You are the most prepared person I've heard. That is incredible. How do you, um, how do you keep your phone safe from the water? So I have a waterproof box that you probably can't see, but it floats and it's waterproof. So even though I lose some social media out there, I keep on putting it in the box. So when I jumped in for the ball, my phone was bobbing in this box that my buddy helped pick it up and my paddle and we put it in there. So I was really ready to go. The only thing I wasn't prepared for is that yesterday I couldn't zip up the back of my wetsuit. And uh, so when I went in, it was a little more of a shock, but the excitement of it all, it's just fine. You talked about the baseballs not traveling as far. Are the balls floating as much? Because they don't stay floating yes. forever. You had a good window. Um, yeah. The Charlie Blackman home run on, on Tuesday night before you secured it. But I think people would be interested to know 
uh, how long it, it floats for, and then what happens after when it sinks to the bottom of the cove? So they float for roughly a minute. Now, I haven't done it scientifically, but I don't think it's changed greatly. There have been 151 true splash hits and about 50 balls that have bounced in 200. And of those 200 home run balls in 23 years, there have been four balls that have sunk, three um, balls from opponents where people didn't run as hard, particularly in the Bonds era when they just wanted a Bonds home run. And we lost one giant home run when I was on vacation in Europe a couple of years ago. But my my day-to-day retirement job is diving underwater and recovering lost items. So I can dive with no visibility and all but one time, I've gone to the bottom of McCovey Cove, which is about 20 feet, and hunted around in pure blackness and found lost cell phones from people. I once caught a splash hit from Max Muncy, the Dodgers, and I gave it to my buddy, and he dropped it in the water. What happens is once it's been in the water, it's kind of like a sponge that if you drop it back in, it could just go right down, and that ball did. And I came back and I dove to the bottom and I found that Max Muncy home run ball. So you fished it out of the ocean. I'm I kidding. Did, I did. I did. Because <laughs> we know it's not the ocean. I know. I know. I know. So this is, this is, in fact, I've gotten two Max Muncy. This is the one that Mad Bum and Muncy had words were, you know, Mad Bum, who's pretty conservative and stuff, said, hey, don't walk, run. And then Muncy said, go get it out of the ocean if you want it. But I was the one who swam out of the ocean. I did the heavy lifting, but so that's a special rivalry ball because of those words. And I, and it's, it's on my little favorite uh, location here, but, uh, um, anyhow, so I will go down there and find items on the bottom. There's actually a lot of old batting practice balls that have, um, gone to the bottom and it's kind of like a graveyard for lost balls. Oh, that's so cool. That's so eerie, it feels like. It's kind of spooky. The normal person would not do it, but my day job is basically recovering thousands of golf balls at all the Bay Area golf courses. So uh, I will go and find three to 5,000 balls in lo- uh, lakes or ponds at golf courses. And that's how I, that's my day job. People might be surprised to know that you know, you never had to fish out a Barry Bonds home run ball from the Cove, but at your day job, you were able to do something much like that, right? Yes. Right behind me here, I have a Barry Bonds. I'm going to grab it real quickly here. <laughs> yes. I apologize. Here it is. Loving the bright orange shirt, of course. I know. It he's was, so on brand. I don't know if you guys can see this. It might be hard because of the light, but. Ooh, it says yeah. Barry Bonds. So what happened is it was a celebrity golf tournament and everybody got sleeves of balls. I wasn't there that day, but my buddy said, oh, yes, Barry hit one into eight. Now, it was a no visibility pond and I found like 3000 balls in there and I got the Barry Bonds ball. I started uh, kayaking McCovey Cove at the very end of Barry's career, really 2005, and he really wasn't hitting many. Um he had one home run when I was there and I was in the, I was in the best location, but it was the wrong location. But when people say, Hey, do you have a Barry Bonds ball? Sometimes I go, yeah, I got one. Fished it out of the water. That is perfect. You are so uniquely positioned for this reputation you have for yourself. This is fascinating. Thank you. I have had a lot of fun and made a lot of friends and I've made a lot of friends with players and stuff over the time in the, area before pre-COVID, I regularly had lunch with different Giants players and became friends with Hunter Pence. And uh, I caught eight home runs from the Panda. And so I kind of feel like like a, a secondary mascot to the team in some way. You're the oh. fourth outfielder, right? You're the fourth yeah. outfielder for the Giants. And of all things, someone made a McCovey Cove Dave bobblehead. So they sell a a Dave uh, bobblehead. It looks pretty authentic. It's it's got it's got everything except for they make me look a lot younger. But it was pretty awesome. I think it might have been the bobblehead Hall of Fame, right? Wasn't that who made this? Yes, you got it. It's in the ball. The bobblehead Hall of Fame made it. Yes. Now, I think people would be curious to know 
on, on those days, like you said, on the weekends when there's a lot of people out there, and again, some are, are veterans, some of them are just people coming in, you know, for the series. Yeah. But there are certain rules out on the cove because if you don't yeah. follow them, people can get hurt. That being yeah. said, there have been some injuries out on the cove as well. So it, there's some unwritten rules, but all the regulars know it. Um, basically, when someone gets their hand on the ball like that, it's over. It's their ball. There's no, like inside the park on like Barry Bonds balls, even when someone had the ball in their hand, people can, it was like a, a brawl fight. But in McCovey Co., once they have it in their hand, it's theirs. Um when we hit each other in the cove, it's really inadvertent that we're like old guys kind of, you know, trying to act younger than we are. And so, like, last night, I, me and Mark collided, but it was not intentional. And we're good friends, and we're going to be talking tonight. Um, I'm trying to think what other rules we have. There are rules where big boats with motors cannot come in the, the zone where the balls land. So it's basically an area for inflatables kayaks paddle boards um in the early days of it they allowed zodiacs and zodiacs you know have propellers and with the kayak the kayakers and particularly the surfers there was a risk of uh people being injured so they stopped the motorboats and uh we evolved to where we are we're very excited that next year we're going to get two launch ramps at mccovey cove so for people coming out from colorado you can rent a kayak but if your friends have a kayak there's going to be two nice uh, ramps the Giants are building on the south side of McCovey Cove. And you'll be able to pull your car up, get your kayak out. The only issue is basically finding a parking spot. But uh, the McCovey Cove will have some nice improvements. That's cool. Yeah, that is definitely on. Uh, that is one of the big things on my baseball bucket list because I feel like I've done a lot, but that is one thing that I have not done yet. And I love kayaking. I think I got some good arms for it. I think yes. I could really crush it out there. I'm looking forward to when you come out. You got to give me advance notice and uh, uh, come out on a week weekend where it's it's really fun. We have some people that really get into cooking, and uh, I'm pretty good at getting a free meal, and I all score stuff for you too, Susie. Oh, I appreciate that. I will hold you to that because I get yes. hungry. So uh, thank you, though. I appreciate it. You bet. So weekends, a little bit more fun, right? Because you got that juice. You've got yeah. that excitement around. Is there a better time of the year? I mean, I imagine the water is probably always cold. But maybe in September, it's a little bit warmer. Yeah, you know, I, I actually think the most important thing is to have good air temperatures. So like the next, not today, but the next four days if you can really kind of do it last second um and get it when there's heat wave it's much better at 75 or 80 degrees it's going to be 75 80 degrees in a couple days which is highly uh, unusual when it does get that warm there are more splash hits so like as a rule whenever san francisco gets above 70 degrees i'm there because the ball does travel further um i have little things i look at like for instance the probability of a home run going far off a right-handed pitcher is higher than a left-handed pitcher. So I'm very excited when the pitchers are both right-handed. They give up more long home runs to left-handed hitters to right field. So I do a bunch of things that kind of give me little advantages, but a warm weather game, I'm there. That's a good tip for our DraftKings Sportsbook uh, better yeah. 70 degrees or more. Eh, balls will yeah. be flying a little bit, especially if there's a right-handed pitcher on the hill. Okay. Yes, exactly. That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. I am fascinated by all of this, but I also, I'm so fascinated that we learned that you are also good at catching home run balls on land. I know you're a big fan of Coors Field, too. You said that you've been there a bunch. What's your favorite part of Coors Field? So my favorite part, and there's no questions asked about it, in the left field going towards the trees in center field, there's a special area. It's really the first row, and it's really designed for handicapped people. But if a handicapped person has, has the tickets free at the last second, they, they're allowed to sell them on the market. So I try to get those tickets because you're going to get a short home run, and there's better viewing. If you get on the first row in that area, it's about 15 feet wide and they have the chair spread out. So that's where you'll find me when I come to course. And I love course. I love, I love the whole, 
um, developed downtown. I stayed, oh gosh, what was the hotel? The Rally Hotel on my last trip. I loved nice. it. It was themed, Rockies theme. Um, the whole downtown area there is is impressive. And, and the people are very friendly. When we're back home next week, we'll have to scout out the batter's eye in center field because there's some water fountains out there. We'll have to see if your kayak would be big enough to fit out there. I mean, I, it might not I'd be as much fun, but we'll put you out there. I'd love it. I'd love it. <laughs> I'd love it. That's amazing. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Go ahead, plug away. I know you've got a, a bunch of different side projects, but uh, plug away on, on social media and just, just anything else that uh, you want to promote here today. Well, if they'd like to follow me on social media, uh, my handle on Twitter and Instagram is McCovey Cove Dave, and I will give you the McCovey Cove report um, every game I'm out there, and I'll give you an inside story. When I meet a player, I will take video of it, and I'll share it with them, and um, if they love baseball, um, also if they stay in contact with me through Instagram, I will give them tips on a future trip to uh, McCovey Co. I respond to all my messages. Yes, you do. I appreciate you responding to mine. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's it. We do the same thing on Twitter at DNVR underscore Rockies. I'm at Patrick D. Lyons on Twitter. I am at the Susie Hunter on all platforms. And this has been wonderful as always, but you know what they say about momentum. It's only as good as your next show. So we'll talk to you then.